Thank you all for coming. So we are going to be presenting today uh, using user-centered design to build a lighthouse for an ocean of data. I just want to let everybody know uh, that none of the authors here, we have any uh, disclosures or conflicts of interest. Our learning objectives today are going to be explaining user-centered design and this approach into building uh, clinical applications. We also want to describe how we can assess that application using the exper uh, user experience questionnaire. We want to also contrast the benefits and the drawbacks of a problem-oriented view information of the health IT systems that we have with our traditional display. And then also um, how biomedical terminologies uh, can be leveraged to generate this problem-oriented problem view automatically. So, so many of us are in the room are clinicians, but one thing we all have in common is that we've all been patients. We've all been sitting in the doctor's office. The doctor comes in and says something like, so what kind of medical problems do you have? So people want to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> but we also have to consider the picture from the position of the physician. Uh, leading up to your appointment, they have about two minutes to sort through all the medical information that's ever been recorded about you, stored anywhere in, in the country, anywhere in the system, uh, make sense of all the numbers that they've, been, uh, that they've seen. The result looks something like this. So we have all these packets of data, and it's just crashing on shore, and it is of, no, of use to no one. What we need, though, is something that's going to be helping to guide that amount of data in and guide it in safely. So we need like a lighthouse so that we can deliver the data at the right time to the right person and keep us ship shape. So um, we mentioned CareView. CareView was kind of the, the initial uh, project broaching into this space, addressing just a very limited scope, just emergency room physicians, just dealing with a few specific symptoms. And here we have chest pain. So it shows specific data related to chest pain in the emergency department uh, that the emergency room physician will want to know. And it gathers the, all the data from anywhere that it, what, where it lives uh, so that they know uh, for a fact where, what the echo was. They know there hasn't been a cardiac cath anywhere in the record just by, just by, uh, just by looking at this display. Um, but the problem is, how do we take this display and scale it up to not just one type of patient, not just one type of doctor, not just one type of location, but to cover all conditions, all patients, all providers? Uh, well, the story starts uh, with the data, of course. When we talk about data, uh, we know that it's generated in little chunks. Uh, people make observations, laboratories make observations, physicians write notes, uh, and it's all assigned labels through terminology, such as LOINC, uh, or uh, ICD or SNOMED, uh, all those little pieces of data then get packaged somehow. We have the advantage in our day and age of having FHIR, which provides very convenient containers to package the, that data and ship it from one place to another. Um, even when it arrives at its destination, the terminology is used to group it together uh, into some kind of relevant structure. For instance, uh, if you're measuring blood sugar, you might put the venous draw with the capillary draw and the arterial draw uh, so that that data is shown together. However, um, the library only has one way to sort things. They either have to sort by author or they have to sort by year. Um, they, uh, they, 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 that's the only way that they can group things, but, that's not, but sorting it just one way is not sufficient to group medical data uh, because for every different situation, you require different grouping. So uh, the, the, what they developed to fix that was little electronic librarians. You can go and search for different things that you need in the chart, but every item that you search for requires a separate request uh, and another and more cognitive burden to find it. Um, an example of this can be seen in the problem list itself. For those of you who haven't seen electronic medical record, this is something like what doctors see when they first uh, look in the chart at a patient. They see a list of problems. Uh, now, if you read through that list, and you don't have to, uh, you might see that there's things that can't possibly exist at the same time, like multiple stages of kidney disease. You might also see that there's things that are probably no longer relevant, like an ankle sprain, uh, clogging up the problem list, making it much less useful. Uh, the result is that doctors don't really use it. Um, this is a problem because this is how doctors are supposed to summarize the information about their patients so they can get it all together in one place. 
Now, we've been talking about the problem-oriented view, and the good thing to know is where did it come from? So in 1968, Larry Weed published a seminal article in New England Journal of Medicine, and, and he was also a scientist as well. And he could not believe that when he was on the wards working with the House officers, that the way the medical record was organized, it was done chronologically, the data wasn't put together, and he really felt the electronic record should mirror a scientist's notebook. So what he's come together is that you need to have a problem and then a clear plan. And so he came up with the SOAP note, or the Subjective Objective Assessment and Plan. So here on the right, as you can see, this is in his style of what the uh, of an assessment of plan for somebody with type 2 diabetes would be. You can see how they're monitoring it, whether it's controlled or not, what the regimen is, uh, what screening needs to be done, when it's going to be followed up. So we know that the problem list has been shown to uh, decrease the time of information retrieval. Patients that have systolic heart failure on their problem list are more likely to have ACEs inhibitors prescribed, so doctors will follow guidelines better. So taking this, there have been people that have forced their clinicians to say, use the problem-based charting in the system as it is. But what has been found with this is that they even note that one of the challenges is that the current way that it is set up is not usable. It's clumsy. It's slow. Doctors find it still easier to do the narrative. And this is interesting because even in 2012, the uh, Institute of Medicine had said, you know, we need to work on usability. This is a patient safety issue. And yet still when they're looking at uh, papers and looking at navigation and usability, they're still seeing that we are increasing the cognitive load too much. And in fact, we know by different survey studies that we are burning doctors out by the EHR. It's at least one part um, uh, in a factor of burnout. So what we need is a way to link all the relevant data to the problems and show them in one place so you no longer need to switch contexts in order to find the information. Uh, and there's a very common concept that we use to group data together in one place where we can see it quickly at a glance at, uh, for when it's relevant, and that is a dashboard. Uh, so we conceptualize the idea of a problem list dashboard or a problem dashboard that would show a single, uh, all the relevant data to a single problem in a single place and be sensitive to the context that the, that the patient is in. Uh, so here we can look at systolic heart failure, and we see some things that are relevant to that problem. A cardiologist note, a stress echo, medications that are relevant to it, uh, as, as well as other measurements. Uh, we worked with Julia Otteson and Lex Suarez, who are not here today, uh, to develop this over the course of about five or six weeks. They were summer interns. Uh, and then we uh, exposed clinicians to this in a qualitative examination. Uh, so, for this qualitative examination, we use contextual design principles. So for those of you who are not familiar with contextual design, we're going to go through what that is, basically. Uh, so first, most important principle, this is not done in a laboratory. You don't take the doctor somewhere else and have them perform a task in an artificial environment. That tends to skew the data. So this was done right in the context where doctors work, in their offices and in their clinics. Uh, you form a partnership with the clinic. This is uh, with, with the doctor, uh, which is usually done through what's called uh, the um, master-apprentice relationship. So basically, as the evaluator, you pretend that you know nothing. Even though uh, I designed the dashboard that the physicians were using, I pretended that I knew nothing about it. I didn't know what the buttons did. Uh, and I let them explore, and I would ask them questions about what they were thinking or why they did certain things. Like, why did you hit that button? What would you expect that button to do? Uh, and this allows the physician or the participant to kind of be in the driver's seat and, re and results in them uh, revealing a lot of qualitative data that's very useful. Uh, the next thing is you need to interpret the actions that the, that the participant takes. Uh, so the main way to do this is through the think aloud mechanism. So you tell the doctor, whatever you're doing, just think aloud, just tell me exactly what you're thinking. Uh, doesn't matter what it is. If you think this stinks and you hate it, just say that. That's great. That's great input. Um, and in that way, you can begin to interpret the actions that they're taking uh, in order to inform the next, the next phase of the design. Last principle, focus. There are only certain things that you're really focused on in a contextual design. You don't want them going off and exploring eBay uh, when, you're, when you're trying to evaluate an electronic health record. Uh, so you, you, try, you nudge them towards the things that, uh, that are useful, usually through the use of a script. Uh, we did prepare a script, uh, and we presented them with something like this. Uh, so this is a deduplicated version of the problem list. There are lots of commercial products out there 
that will deduplicate a problem list and reduce it down just to things that are relevant. Uh, that is not new uh, or, or novel. Uh, so we presented them with this and we allowed them to begin to explore. Some of them began looking at the tabs across the top, uh, but eventually, usually they would click on one of the problems uh, and they want, would wind up in our dashboard. We allowed them to explore, thinking aloud as they went, we would ask them questions, and there were certain features we wanted them to examine, uh, so we wanted to make sure that we got feedback on those. So one of those features was that little button down there that says Order Plus. Uh, and just to give you a quick anecdote, uh, this, is, this is an example of a conversation I had with a physician. Uh, so I'm sitting on, on one side of the physician, they've got the laptop in front of them, they're working, and then on the other side, the intern is furiously typing away, taking notes. Um, so I, 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 they hadn't really noticed the Order Plus button, so I, so I gave them a nudge. I said, what do you think that button does? And I pointed toward it. And they said, oh, I'm not really sure. Maybe it opens a dialog to place orders, like an order menu? And I said, maybe we should try it. So the clinician clicked on it, and then a little tooltip appeared. It said, order added to queue. And the clinician said, oh, well, I, I guess it added an order. And I said, well, what order? And the clinician said, uh, well, I guess it placed an order related to what we're doing here, so a uh, stress echo. Oh, I can see how that would be helpful sometimes. But I was really confused when I saw that. I didn't really know what would happen when I clicked it. And I said, well, what would make it clearer? And they said, oh, well, maybe you could move the order plus button closer to stress echo, or, or maybe you could put stress echo right in the button. Or, or, you know, with time, I might just learn how to use that the way that it is. Um, so that, and that way you can co collect a lot, of, uh, a lot of ideas for the next iteration of a design uh, and, and, and derive that from the, direct, the workflow that the, that, the, that the participant is using. Uh, so between each version of the dashboard, so we showed them the clunky problem list with all the different diagnoses. We showed them the simplified version, which had just the, the, uh, the, just the five problems. Uh, and then we showed them the dashboard version. And after each version, we gave them a user experience questionnaire. So you might notice that this is not the classic uh, system usability scale uh, that's used for many applications. Uh, we chose to use this scale specifically for a few reasons. Uh, one of them is that the system usability scale is really only proven to, for one scale, usability. It doesn't have any dimensionality inside of that. And we wanted to get a little bit more insight into it. We found that a lot of investigators seem to fall into the trap of taking a single question from the system usability scale and trying to de derive conclusions from just that one question, which is not really the way that Likert scales are meant to be used. Uh, so we picked this one, uh, but we knew we were going to be running this questionnaire by them again and again. Uh, so we didn't want the longer version on the left. We took the short version on the right, uh, which is not quite as strong, but would allow us to measure two different dimensions. Uh, so it, it takes eight of these elements from the left and puts them over on the right there. Uh, and the top four measure uh, how useful uh, someone thinks that it is. Um, and the bottom four measure how pleasing it is to them. Uh, so, and we, and, we measured, and we measured those two after each version. Uh, the results that we got were very interesting. Uh, we found that people, uh, so pragmatic is usefulness, and then hedonic is uh, the, the, the pleasure or the stimulation that they get from, from using it. And then we had, an overall, uh, we had the overall scale. And we found that people really liked the look of the simplified version that just deduplicated everything. But really for usefulness, they really wanted uh, the dashboard version that would, that would group that data together. That was a strong effect on, on our, on our uh, on our participant base. Uh, so for the next version, uh, we're going to implement a lot of the qualitative changes, that they, uh, a lot of the changes that they recommended when we collected the qualitative data. Uh, but we also feel like we need to address just a very few specific disease states uh, in order to kind of narrow, narrow our focus uh, and get the best results possible from those. So we want to try to target diseases that are going to have the highest prevalence as well as the highest complexity. These are going to be things like heart disease, diabetes, kidney disease, and pulmonary diseases. And this is the time where we wanted to kind of open it up to the group here and see, you know, are there, from your experience, either is this a good place to start, or do you think there's other disease processes or things that we should be looking at? Go ahead, Dr. Downs. I like your dimensions of complexity and prevalence, but um, you might want to add in um, practice variation. So there are some complex 
prevalence problems that everybody handles pretty much the same way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. A very Good solid point. point. Yes, absolutely. We would want to address something that has greater practice variation because we'd expect to see uh, a greater impact from an intervention in that area. That was a great insight. Thank you, Dr. Downs. Uh, so we're going to be looking at uh, submitting an R01 grant, and our first aim in this is really going to be trying to determine the relevance uh, of the information of a probably in problem oriented view of these patient conditions. We want to try to evaluate this through a cognitive task analysis using uh, physicians from various uh, areas, uh, such as inpatient, outpatient, the emergency department. And we want to show them the, uh, the dashboard and we want them to rate these items and say, how relevant are they? Are they very relevant, somewhat not at all relevant? So we realized that, that is, this is different from prior work that has been done uh, that try to classify data items as either relevant or not relevant and don't look for any gray area in between. But since we're, we're looking at not only what data might be relevant to heart disease, but what is relevant right now uh, for, the, for the doctor to see, we wanted to introduce uh, something in, in between. Uh, so we thought that this would give, give us better granularity and, and uh, help us to to decide what to show a little bit more accurately. Uh, are there any special pitfalls or, or issues that are, uh, that are related with, to, a, to a three point scale like this? Uh, I think it's gonna be a little hard for you guys to define relevance because relevance, um, what I've seen from previous studies where we try to check on relevance of particular things to a clinical practice, it really depends on the patient in the case they are looking at, you know, I mean, and, and also the practice and who is actually looking at the data, like mm -hmm. who is the practitioner looking at the, at the data and at, at that particular patient at the time. Because what may be relevant for me with 20 years of training may not be relevant for you with one year of training and vice versa, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's a little hard to just say hi somewhat and not. I would I'd be curious to see if, we, if you do this way, what results you're gonna have, mm -hmm. but in, for instance, when I was working on my PhD a long time ago, one of the things that I wanted to ask for them is if a clinical question was relevant to a particular patient, right? And if the results from literature review were relevant to that clinical question for a specific patient and results were completely different. The agreement among physicians were like 60%. <laughs> right? With some physicians said, yeah, this is a very relevant question for this, and this is very re relevant literature for this. But the other ones say, uh, uh this is not a question that I would ask for this patient, and this paper has nothing to do with this patient, right? So mm -hmm. I think that's a very hard concept. Mm -hmm. So I'll be curious to, to understand, you know, I, I look at you're doing from cognitive task analysis, that's exactly what I did. And it was very hard for me to establish that. So mm -hmm. curious on how you, you were thinking about this approach. It, it may be possible, I just, you know, I, curious. I know, and we've talked about that, and we know that we're, and that's one of the reasons to try to hit a couple of different areas, especially between inpatient, outpatient, ED, because we know that, like you said, the context is gonna matter and the relevance is gonna matter depending on where you're at. And then we've also thought about when you ask these questions, you also need to take into account, like you said, the experience. Because what is use, what you know a second year resident is gonna need is gonna be different than potentially what a someone with 15, 20 years of practice. Yeah, I, I think the problem is relevant to what, mm -hmm. right? It's relevant to what? Relevance information to what, right? To treat the patient, to search for more, to ask for more exams, right? Lab tasks, to mm -hmm. what? What, what is the relevance to you about? Because relevance is a word like big, right? It can mm -hmm. mean a lot different things to different people. So I would try to narrow this a little bit more to mm -hmm. relevance to what? What do you really want to get from there? Uh, well, uh, I think that in our minds, we were considering, uh, as you said, uh, what would be relevant to a doctor who's looking to take action on a patient? Uh, right. So, what would be what would be relevant to the next step in the process? Um, however, I can I can I can see what you're saying, and I'm curious to see um, I'm curious myself to see how doctors will interpret that concept of relevance. Mm -hmm. um, whether they will just mark everything as relevant or or nothing as relevant. Um, 
that uh, based on based on what's what's uh, needed at the moment. Um, but that's that's a good point. Probably we should provide some additional instructions to the to the participants to make sure that they understand what direction we're trying to take this. I, I think. Um basing it around decision making you have a, a strong foundation here at regan street on which you can build um in terms of you know in the frame of decision support mm -hmm. um yeah I, i'm curious there I, I can see a lot of different dimensions or potential uh complexities or opportunities in this and when you think of relevance of information are you thinking like by loint code is this you know how are you rating this because and when I think about what what information is relevant, there's a lot of different ways it can it can be the absence of some information might be relevant, the yeah. the trend of it, the um, the fact that something normal might be more relevant than it being abnormal. There's so mm -hmm. there's there's a lot of different ways in which you could look at data and just the state of those that you know those data might influence the relevance. So um, I, you know, to me, you know, I, I look at this and say, well, maybe in the world we're in now, if you could gather all those data of, of, of different, different uh, aspects or states of the information, as well as the states of the provider and the states of the patient, mm -hmm. and see if maybe a computer might be able to figure it out uh, when humans can't. Yeah, I, li I like the idea of the uh, relevance of information to decision making, to an action, right, what mm -hmm. you mentioned before. Because then you you may say, okay, what is your action could be? Would be to continue the path for that mm -hmm. particular treatment or whatever you are doing, like, you know, or to change the path, right? To change a medication or not to change a medication. You know, if you do more concrete, concrete things as the relevance to what, mm -hmm. I think you're gonna probably get better results and better understanding of what you are asking them. Yeah. to do. There's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, we've had discussions because there is a time in which you are, because there's also an acute kind of phase for things or where you're monitor, monitoring chronic conditions. Um, and so we've kind of talked about that. And, and we've had those same discussions of certain labs. If you're looking at hypercalcemia, a normal PTH is not normal for that. So, you know, we have brought that in. And so it's not that we necessarily only want to show abnormal labs. Uh, we want to make sure that we're, we would then be highlighting all these. But, but I understand what you're saying. I, I, I think it's, it's, it's not just because it might be normal or abnormal, you know, acknowledging that and saying, okay, well then parathyroid hormone is relevant mm -hmm. is, a, you know, that's a, a first step. But I, I guess what I'm pushing you toward is saying, well, you know, can you get to the level of knowing, well, is a high PTH, the PTH or a low PTH or the fact that PTH wasn't done or a PTH mm -hmm. that's going mm -hmm. up or going down, which of those is relevant so that you can kind of clean up or in terms mm -hmm. of or like really focus on not just, you know, the loint codes are relevant, mm -hmm. but actually the, the, you know. Yeah. Maybe sometimes you're going to find it's the trajectory of that result that mm -hmm. matters on the decision making, not the result itself, right? If you're looking at patients with diabetes, if you see that the curve is going up, although they are still with hemoglobin H1C in a normal level, they may be, they be pumping that up, right? Mm -hmm. You may see that, mm, this is not looking good. Mm -hmm. right? So I think it may not be the value itself, sometimes maybe different things that will actually give you that answer on the decision making. Mm -hmm. Dr. Downs? Excellent, thank you. Yeah, we, uh, along the same lines as we've been discussing, uh, we know that there are several dimensions to, to relevance. You know, there's the, the data itself, uh, meaning that whether another piece of data is high or low or trending up may influence the relevance of another piece of data. We know that the, and also the trend uh, and the value influences it. How long ago 
the data was collected may also be relevant, um, may influence relevance, I should say. And then also the patient themselves, what other diagnoses they have may cause a, a piece of data to be more or less relevant. We know that the doctor that's looking at them, whether it's a pulmonologist or an endocrinologist, changes the relevance. We know where they are changes the, changes the relevance. Uh, there are definitely many factors that influence relevance, and we're hoping to, to measure some of those as part of this study. And you already mentioned this. Um, <clears throat> respondents might have a tendency to say, well, there's nothing that's really irrelevant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> to relevance, okay. Give me as much as possible. Now, their experience would be different when they actually get that on a dashboard. Mm -hmm. Because at the end, mm -hmm. the dashboard becomes less useful the more you give them. I'm not saying don't ask a relevance question, but you might also say, of the relevant information, what are the three most critical to management? You know, mm -hmm. now they're going to have to pick three, but if you have a large group, you might find things that rise to the top. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I, I know that we're also planning on using controls. So uh, having an item that we know is very, very relevant to a given issue and then uh, that we're going to leave absent and not include uh, and see if they go look for it and say, this is really relevant. Why wasn't it there? And then also include items that we know are not relevant at all to the issue at hand. Uh, so that if they mark that as a, as a two on a scale of five, then we know that two really is one. <laughs> and it's just skewed toward, the, skewed toward the higher relevance. Maybe just to bring it back around to what I was saying earlier, maybe one approach could be to say, how would you change your decision if this was trending up? How would you change it if it was trending down? How would you mm -hmm. change it if it hadn't been done? That mm -hmm. might be a way to get toward the, the you know, question of relevance mm -hmm. and those different, uh, different ways of looking at the data. And the, the other thing I'd throw out is that uh, this is great. I mean, I think seeing you guys go in this direction is great, and this could be a great tool. But in case you think you're creating the solution, I just wanted to let you know there's not once that I had to ask a student or a resident to write out a dashboard for me. You know, what I want is the to them to present the patient. And so mm -hmm. I think this is a great step toward building the tool that can help someone quickly create that presentation. But ultimately, I expect by the time you guys graduate that you have the computer presenting the patient to me. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure we'll be able to deliver on that promise. Uh, we should move ahead to our, our next aim, though, I think, unless we have, do we have more comments or questions about this aim? Excellent. So the second aim is going to be using that user-centered design uh, for this clinician-friendly problem list and hopefully doing some type of usability test, uh, probably studying a lot of some of those same uh, clinicians from the various backgrounds and, and getting at, you know, where, where are we at now? So getting a problem list that, the way it looks now and then giving them also then the, the viewer, our updated problem dashboard and seeing uh, what is their user satisfaction, you know, or how fast are we getting, are they getting that information, looking at keystrokes, clicks, uh, maybe even decision-making speed, um, some of those, these types of objective findings. Um, and then we may even test how this data is presented, whether do we present all of it and highlight certain things, or do you only present what has been deemed uh, as relevant or relevant, highly relevant, highly relevant, uh, mm -hmm. with the caveats of all the previous discussions. And so, uh, and again, with it, I would uh, love to hear your guys' comments uh, as you did on the first day. Yep, go ahead. Outside of scope, but somebody reviewing this is going to ask. Um, there's a. <coughs> Item here, which is such that, that some measure of the quality of care or the quality of outcomes, the fact that the physician is more satisfied and makes the quicker decisions um, would be sort of pointless if the care delivered was inferior. Um, so somebody's going to say, Well, you're selectively presenting information to the clinician. Do you maybe enhancing their decision making, but you may be impairing their decision making? Mm -hmm. And, and we did discuss this, um, and I think one of the kind of what I likened it to in my mind was this is almost like when you set up a, uh, for board exams and you have a multiple choice question, and you're asking, you know, sometimes it's very difficult to know because you know you may ask five different doctors how they would handle the the one clinical situation. You give them the exact same one, and you may get ten different answers on how it would be. So sometimes I, that's where I was concerned about is trying to do that because in the end we all want to make sure that we're having better outcomes for patients and doing better. Um, but sometimes that can also be very subjective. 
Um, we have talked about how, you know, potentially some of these is looking at, you know, what is clearly established guidelines, uh, and maybe that's a way, you know, that we mm -hmm. set up these scenarios um, that we can see, you know, other decisions that they made, was it according to guidelines or not? Uh, but again, it's, I know that's yeah, very, very difficult to do. There may be a subset of tasks that are uh, very, very closely aligned with guidelines uh, so that there would be a clear right answer to do uh, or not do. Uh, according to the guidelines, and we could see if practice variation uh, is decreased by using the dashboard as compared with uh, the current state. Yep. Uh, you know, yeah, I think trying to get to outcomes is, is obviously would be ideal, but um, maybe uh, just this is brainstorming mm -hmm. an approach might be to say, you know, what you're trying to do is give me in my five minutes, can I be as good as I, I could be if I had an hour? And yeah. So one question would be is, I, I, I sacrifice a good chunk of my weekend doing chart review so that when I get in clinic, um, I, I'm, I, you know, I'm hopefully taking decent care of my patients. And, and, uh, and so maybe one could be, uh, you get five minutes to look at the chart and then, and then make your decisions now you get an hour to look at the chart and make decisions. Mm -hmm. Now use our tool and see if in five minutes can you make decisions that are more like mm. what you did when you had an hour. Mm -hmm. And, and compare that with different clinicians, I guess. Hmm. That's, that's an interesting thought. I, mean, I think that would be nice too because it, I mean, part of our whole thing is, is we are wanting to try to give time back to clinicians. So just as and I do the same thing, I uh, waste a lot of time before, you know, half my clinic time is in prepping. Uh, so I spend two hours prepping for four hours of clinic. Um, but we're trying to deliver, give time back to the clinician. And so that would be a good way of trying to maybe even quantify some of that time. Yeah, this is to address the preloading issue of, of clinical care, uh, where I have tools like ambient intelligence addressing the, the post-loading portion of patient care. Hi, this is An Andrew. I have... Uh... Oh, somebody talking. All right. All right. Thank you guys very much for your attention and time. We enjoy presenting to you.